Hey guys, I have a uh, very special guest, my parish priest, Father Derek. Uh, he's been kind enough to accept an invitation. Uh, next week is Pentecost Sunday, so I wanted to um, just talk about how it relates to us Catholics today. Uh, so welcome, Father Derek. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, and uh, welcome to all our viewers today. So we read in the Book of Acts, chapter 2, that the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began preaching. Um, how does that relate to us today? The, it, the, what is the relevance of Pentecost Sunday? How can we make this Sunday the most relevant Pentecost Sunday we've ever experienced? Right. So Pentecost was the birthday of the church. Okay? It's the birthday of the church. And uh, it's important to get some little background. So if we look at the apostles, those who are in the upper room, uh, Peter denied Jesus three times when Jesus was being crucified. Uh, all the other apostles, except for John, ran away. They were too afraid to be near Jesus in his time of suffering. And when we read the account of Pentecost, we read that they were hiding in that upper room in fear, wow. in fear of the Jews. So we can assume that it was our Blessed Mother who was there giving them strength and encouraging them. Amen. So Our Lady plays a very important role in the Pentecost story. Amen. And so these guys and the other disciples too are in that upper room. And then the Holy Spirit comes with tongues of flame, tongues of fire. Right. And these same people who were frightened, who were huddling there in fear, we read that they were now boldly proclaiming the gospel. Amen. Now, how did that happen? Right? That's the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. at work in the life of the apostles. And that same Holy Spirit is available to us to be at work in our lives if we are open to the Holy Spirit. Now, as Catholics, uh, we are uh, into the sacraments, okay? Uh, the sacramental life for us is very important. And in baptism and in confirmation, we receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Holy Spirit very often is dormant in our lives and it has to be stirred up. Amen. And that's what it means to live a life led by the Holy Spirit is when the gifts of the Holy Spirit are stirred up in our life and we choose every day to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. When we choose to come to him in humility, in poverty, Amen. to receive everything he wants to give us. So why, we, why do you think that we're not experiencing the book of Acts. The church, we are the same church. Jesus Christ established the Catholic Church. This is why I came back to the Catholic Church. So I knew this was the church. Historically, there's no denying it. How come we see the book of Acts, all these healings and speaking in tongues and prophecy, and we don't see it in America as well, much? Right. Yes. So the Holy Spirit can work in our lives to the extent that we allow him to. There was a professor in my seminary, her name is Dr. Raja. She uh, has a ministry of healing. And she says that when she goes to Africa and third world countries, you see many healings taking place. The lame walk, the deaf ear, the mute speak. Wow. It's a little harder in first world countries. Why? Because over here, People are clinging to their possessions, to their intellect, to their uh, whatever they have. Over there, you know, people may not be that well off, so they are more open. They come with a greater spirit of poverty. Okay. Whatever we have is a gift from God. Amen. So we have to also approach the Lord in poverty ready to receive everything he wants to give us and when we do that when we have that right disposition that's when the lord can work in our life that's when 
the Holy Spirit is stirred up. Now, you mentioned something important saying, uh, you know, why don't we see it? You know, it's because the the coals have gotten cold, <laughs> you know, to put it that way. Wow. You know, uh, we have to fan into flame, as scripture says. Amen. We have to fan into flame the gift that we have received. Amen. So, so many Catholics are there who are baptized, confirmed. So what has happened? The Holy Spirit is dormant. Father Larry Richards, uh, he's a famous preacher, and he uses the analogy of chocolate milk. So when you put a chocolate syrup in a glass of milk, it sits on the bottom. The flavor is not chocolate. So when you stir it up, that's when that milk becomes Amen. chocolate. I love that analogy. Yeah. And so we have the Holy Spirit in baptism, in confirmation, but the Holy Spirit can be sitting dormant if we don't choose to allow him to work in our life. St. Paul says, do not quench the spirit. Mm -hmm. So obviously we can quench the spirit. So you're yes. saying we could quench the spirit by hanging on to our material things, our intellect, and just not allowing God's grace to flow in us. Yes, but by living a life in the flesh as opposed to living life in the spirit. This is one wonderful lesson I learned in seminary from a priest called Father Nicholas Kakia who sadly passed away uh, last year to cancer. Uh, and I always interpreted flesh as sins of the flesh. Yeah. So we can conveniently say, oh, I don't commit sins of the flesh or mortal sins, and therefore I guess I'm living a life in the spirit. Not really. Living a life in the flesh means that I'm living a life totally dependent on myself, mm. on my talents and my possessions and everything that I own. Whereas a life in the spirit is a life surrendered to God's will, a life open to God, a life open to the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And that is what the Lord calls us to. In, in the book of Acts that you mentioned, chapter 2, where the tongues of fire mm -hmm. fell on the apostles, it says they spoke in tongues and some men heard in their languages, but it said some men, other men mocked them and said, oh, they must be drunk. So apparently they didn't hear the same thing. So would you say that would be some men that were, weren't open, that were, that were closed, that were closed-minded, they were, they were uh, stubborn? You think that's an example? Yes, that could be. That could be because if there were, uh, the others could hear the word of God being preached in their own language, uh, and you know, if you're mocking the apostles, then obviously you, you're not here. You're not open to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And in the, no, and that's uh, no, Acts no, two thirteen. A lot of my uh, subscribers like to take notes. So Acts two thirteen, check it out. Yes. And that's a good apologetic argument for our Protestant. You know, I was Protestant thirty years, and you know, I called myself a Baptist because I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was I believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but I always ended up in Baptist churches and. Uh, and a lot of the Baptists that I fellowship with thought the gifts ceased. And I would say, and they would say, oh, well, you know, tongues back then, everybody understood it. When you, when you speak in tongues, I don't know what you're saying. But some people knew and some people didn't. And even St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you know, if you got strangers, don't speak in tongues because they don't know what you're saying. Unless there's an interpreter, if there's someone with the gift of interpretation. So obviously, they, this gift of tongues, if you don't have an interpreter, it, no one understands. It's like just babbling, gib gibberish to... Right. It was, it was being abused in Paul's time as well, and that's why he said that. Right. And we need to understand that the gift of tongues is, uh, is a gift that's given uh, to enhance prayer and our communication with God. So we can pray. When we pray to God in our prayer, uh, we pray in tongues so that we can relate to him as Abba Father. Amen. Not just like a child relates to a father. We relate to the Lord. Okay? So uh, that's, the, that's the gift of tongues uh, that the Lord gives us. But in a public setting, if the gift of tongues is being exercised, then it's important that there's also the interpretation of tongues happening as well. Very good. Very good. Now, the, um, the church has always taught that we're in spiritual warfare. And I... I pray that God uses these spiritual gifts that we have to help us fight these battles. St. Paul said that 
Um, he was given a spirit to harass him. For, in uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe, he said there was a spirit to harass him, uh, a thorn in his flesh, and he asked God to take it away three times, and three times God said, my grace is sufficient. And St. Paul went on to say that it was given to him to keep him from getting too conceited. So do you see sometimes God allows us, out of his love, to be harassed spiritually? God permits suffering uh, sometimes in our lives in order to help us grow deeper in our faith. Okay, So uh, suffering is permitted okay, so that we can mature in our faith as believers. Okay. Uh, Think of it as your, say your children. Okay, if they are off the beaten path a little bit, <laughs> you know, you want to bring them back. Yes. And if that involves some suffering, uh, some difficulties, uh, you have to accept it because that's the only way they will learn to appreciate the truth. And so, also as believers, we can get complacent. We can stop praying and suffering helps us understand that God is our provider that our life is in his hands and through our suffering we can come to a point of deeper surrender Amen. so I, I've read a lot of books and I've interviewed uh, one exorcist priest Vincent Lamport and they say one of the greatest gifts we have to in spiritual warfare is confession we get to confession and then we get to the mask and partake in the body and blood of Christ. Have you seen that in your in your life as a priest? There are people that are uh, oppressed and just stressed out and the devil just beating them down can come and just God can turn them around through confession. Have you experienced that? Yes. Uh, confession uh, can be a very powerful experience. Again, uh, we have to come to confession with a contrite heart and with a good examination of conscience. So once we make a good examination of conscience, where we ask the Holy Spirit to show us those areas of difficulty in our life, those areas where we failed, that's when we can come to the Lord and bring our sins to Him so as to receive His mercy and grace and forgiveness. Amen. Okay, That's when the miracles happen. Because when we come to confession, we are rejecting Satan and choosing Christ. Amen. And that's the victory that we, we are Amen. winning Amen. in the sacrament. Now, you talked about that great analogy with the chocolate milk. Mm -hmm. And it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, when we're baptized in water, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the church, in her wisdom, knew when we got older, we may need to recommit and confirmation, lay on a hand. Seems like that would be the time for God to stir that chocolate milk in us. But many of us just go through the motions. So later on in life, if someone wanted to stir that up, as evangelicals, we would call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you see in Acts, many times the apostles would lay hands on people so they would receive the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues. So how does the church view that? Like I was baptized in the Holy Spirit as an evangelical by a, a, a Protestant Navy chaplain received the gift of tongues, but he told me that he was baptized by a Navy chaplain who was a Roman Catholic priest, <laughs> and he received the gift of tongues. And when I tell people that, they're like, you know, I, I haven't really talked about it much lately, but when I first came back to the Catholic Church, I told people, and they're like, they scratched their heads. Like, I don't know if that's, if that's right, if he should have did that. Yeah. What's your view of that? Right. So in the Catholic charismatic renewal, we also use the term baptism in the Holy Spirit, but it should not be confused with the sacrament of baptism. It's more of a renewal just, in so the just Holy the Spirit. Stirring up that the stirring up. Stirring yeah. up. So when we do we do something which I hope we can do here soon in English, we just concluded a life in the spirit seminar in Spanish uh, with our Spanish prayer group. And uh, now we are going to do it in, uh, hopefully we'll have a chance hopefully. to do it in English. That would be awesome. And the last session involves uh, praying over the people who come for the seminar. Okay. And when we pray over them, we are praying for a renewal of the gifts that they received in baptism and confirmation. So that is a renewal in the Holy Spirit. So it is a stirring up, as mm -hmm. you suggested. Now, yes. Another thing when I talked to Catholic, when I was a Protestant, I would, like I said, I would 
have to debate cessationists, Baptists that believe the gifts cease. And I would show them that St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, even though the Corinthians were abusing the gifts, even though the Corinthians weren't using them right, uh, St. Paul never said stop using them. Actually, he said use them, you know, do this. And he gave them like an order. But he actually said, do not forbid speaking in tongues. I mean, that's a direct command from St. Paul. Uh, but a lot of times when I talk to Catholics, they got this idea of uh, the charismatic or the renewal, the charismatic renewal movement as getting too Protestant. But it's my understanding that we've had charismatic, what we would call, well, evangelicals would call charismatic Catholics throughout the church. I read about St. Thomas Aquinas when he had his experience with the Holy Spirit. He said, what, uh, all my intellect, everything I've written was straw. And you see St. Augustine, you know, he, I, I read that he uh, rebuked a woman who got a, a healing, a, a gift of healing, because she didn't come and testify. He goes, no, you got to tell the church when God heals you. So do you see that throughout the church? Like the renewal isn't something new. It's just oh, yes. renewing something old from right. the book of Acts. Right. Uh, you know, we are familiar with the Catholic charismatic movement that, began with the Duquesne weekend in, I think it was the 80s or 70s or 80s, 70s. I, I think, think it was early 70s. Early 70s. Yeah. Uh, but the Holy Spirit has always been at work in the church. We see it in the book of Acts. We see it in the early church. Now, after Christianity was legal in Europe, it could be that uh, the it was not as manifest uh, maybe because the coals got too cold, you know, <laughs> uh, because everyone was very comfortable. The church was now a powerful political entity. Uh, but if we read the lives of the saints, we see the gifts of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. Um, whether it's St. John Vianney, who was considered not very bright, and he was sent to this little town of ours, but he transformed that place, wow. not because he's a great person on his own, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit working mm -hmm. through him. Padre Pio was able to tell people their sins. That's the gift of knowledge. Yes. Uh, the, that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes, so we see the gifts of the Holy Spirit throughout the church history uh, in the lives of the saints, especially. Uh, now, uh, in the church, in the contemporary church, uh, we have this Catholic charismatic renewal, which I'm very familiar with. I, I was part of prayer groups even back in India. And I think the, the Lord is inviting us to, uh, to be open to the Holy Spirit so that the church can truly be uh, the church of the book of Acts. Amen. I think the way we are today, um, not just in the United States, but all over the world, we are a missionary church. And we have to be the church of the book of Acts once again. Amen. And I really see that happening. It's a smaller church, but I think the Lord is doing great things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, you know, I grew up Catholic, but we really didn't go to church. Just, you know, receive the sacraments and go Easter and Christmas. And it's just like in New Jersey, if you're Italian or Irish, you were Catholic. It was just part of your identity. But I was surprised when I came back to the church to meet so many on fire Catholics that are part of this new evangelization. Uh, Michael, the young man, Michael, uh, he's excited. I see him every weekend. Uh, and, and Bernardo, I, th I think you've met. There's so many, Joe Fox, that are in the church. And they're not, they're not just reverts that are excited. I mean, we get real excited. We both met Steve <laughs> Ray, you know, that goes without saying, yeah. and Scott Hahn. Yeah. But... Cradle Catholics I'm meeting, I was surprised, that are on fire, that, that are all about the new evangelization. And a lot of, they're open to the Spirit, but they're not familiar with the charismatic gifts. And I really believe that God wants to use Pentecost, the charismatic gifts, to draw baptized Catholics back into the church, whether they're non-religious or whether they're in a Protestant denomination that deny the flesh and blood of Jesus, like I did for so many years. Yeah. And, um, I feel like, you know, I think it was Peter Cripp that says the reason God uses the charismatic Catholic movement so much is when we pray with our Protestant brothers, they can recognize the Holy Spirit in us and we can recognize the Holy Spirit in them. So although we may debate and dialogue 
about spiritual gifts, mm -hmm. we accept one another as brothers. There were so many years I didn't accept Catholics as my brothers. I thought Catholics had a false gospel. Yeah. That was what I was taught. So how do you see the charismatic renewal, the charismatic movement, say, uh, the book of Acts and the new evangelization? Do you see them, like, working together? Oh, yes, totally, 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 right? Yes, because that's what the Lord is inviting us to do, to proclaim the gospel. And uh, we have to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So there's a movement, or uh, rather a ministry called Encounter Ministries. Uh, they've been around for many years. Uh, Father Matthias Thelen, he's a priest from Michigan, uh, who is leading it. Okay. And their, min their mission is to conduct healing services across the country, but to also train people to pray for people so that they can receive healing. Amen. And we've seen it happen, you know, Amen. and uh, that's the power of the Holy Spirit at work. So Amen. when we, somebody comes and says that, you know, they need prayer, you know, we can pray with them right then and there. That's and awesome. trust that the Holy Spirit is going to be at work. Amen. That's awesome. I had uh, Father Mike from Ablaze Ministry on my show, and, mm -hmm. and he talked about healing at his church. And, and he talked about a man with a tumor mm -hmm. and he uh, in adoration, and they took the, uh, the host and put it close to the man's head and prayed for him, and the man's tumor melted, disappeared. Mm -hmm. He went, got x-rays, documented healing. Yes. So there's power. And, what, and to me, it's like when I was an evangelical, the Pentecostal movement meant so much to me because I seen the power of God. And then when I became a Catholic and knew I could have the actual flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, that was even more miraculous. But as Catholics, we could have it all. <laughs> it's like, how much Jesus do you want? How much Jesus do you want? Do you want it all? We have the sacraments. We have the gifts. We have the Bible. I mean, being Catholic means being a full Christian, not, you know, just a denominational Christian, a full the yeah. fullness of Christ. The fullness of truth. The fullness of truth yes. is here. Exactly. How awesome. That, that is so awesome. Absolutely. That yes. is so awesome. So, do you know what you're going to preach on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> I think this has helped. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's so, awesome. Yeah, so you said you were only going for Christmas and Easter? Yeah, back then, yeah. yeah we, and actually, I, I'll confess, as a teenager... Uh, we would go drunk, me and my friends. Like, hey, let's go to uh, Christmas Eve Mass. Oh, you know, nice midnight night Mass. Night. Were you going for Mass? <laughs> no. <laughs> so somehow you were still going for Mass. Somehow, yeah. yeah. And now then, there's another category of Catholics um, who are who don't go just Christmas and Easter. You know what they what do we call them? Uh -huh. It's like it's called. Hatch, match, and dispatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to call them back too in the new yes, evangelization. We have to reach out and, to our brothers and sisters. And and it's easy for me because I knew, I know what a sinner I was. So it's easy for me to talk to these people and not be judgmental. And I think that's you know, I see you know, and, I, and this is another thing I see with Catholics like these cradle Catholics that never miss mass and and they're strong. Sometimes I want to tell them. And I do tell them, thank you for being faithful. You know, you see guys like me and Steve Ray and Scott Hahn, I'm not putting myself in their category, but guys that came back to the, or I don't know if they ever were Catholic, but came into the Catholic Church and we got a bunch of Bible knowledge because we studied the Bible every day. And that's all we had is the Bible. So you better know the Bible because you don't have any sacraments. Uh, but they're like, wow, you guys, you guys are a gift to the church. But I'm like, no, you guys are the greatest gift because if you would have left, there'd be no church for me to come back to. Yeah. And, and I'm so blessed. And I want to say, like, when I see the prodigal son, I think of me, and I came back. And then the devout Catholic that never left, I want them to know that the father's saying to them, what I have for you, you still have. He lost a lot. I lost 30 years of being Catholic. I can never get that back. I wish I never left. Is that your phone, Father? <laughs> <laughs> so you can see this is Blue Collar Catholic. We are not in a professional studio. In fact, uh, we filmed this twice. The first time the, the phone died halfway through. So I said, Father, let me use my phone instead of yours. But we do this to show you that 
you can do all things through Christ. You could be a blue collar Catholic. <laughs> and uh, interview a great priest. <laughs> and uh, things don't have to be uh, perfect. Uh, Father the asked word, me. The, the word is important. The amen. message is important. It's the message. Father asked me if I edit these. I go, not usually. You can edit it if you want for me, if you, if you know how. I said, but, you know, I follow G.K. Chesterton. He said, if something works doing, it's worth doing bad. <laughs> but uh, by the grace of God, we're getting better and better with every interview. Yeah. So, um, where were we? <laughs> yeah, great. So we were talking about the new evangelization. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So the Catholics that have been here and never left, I just want to say thank you and know that what the Father, the heritage you got, the, the blessing you got is will always be there. I lost 30 years. You know, God used it for good. God says he, he renews the years the locusts have eaten and all things work together for good. So what I learned as an evangelical, I'm able to share and encourage you. But there's so much that I missed out on. And there's and I look back and so many times, if I, if I could have went to confession, if I could have went and had the Eucharist, how God could have spared me of so many trials and tribulations in my life. So if you are a cradle Catholic, praise the Lord today and be thankful. But like Father said, be open to the Holy Spirit and ask God to stir you up. For the new evangelization, because that's our calling. Yeah, right? absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. So as we come to Pentecost, and as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, I pray that we will have a greater openness to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit doesn't stop sharing uh, His gifts with us. Amen. Uh, we sometimes put an umbrella up. <laughs> <laughs> so take off the umbrella, take Amen. off the raincoats, and just... Soak in the gifts of the Holy Spirit as he generously uh, gives it to us, especially this Pentecost. I Amen. pray that our parish and our church uh, will truly be like the church in the book of Acts. Amen. That's my prayer, too. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there because um, Father is a good father. And I think he's got somebody to attend to. That was that phone call, I'm guessing. So um, God bless and stay Catholic. Yes, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Father. Keep up the good work and thank you. keep preaching the gospel. Amen. All right. I'm guessing you got a.